You know, in my book, uh, The Canadian Establishment, came out last fall, Titans, my definition of the new Canadian establishment is, is one sentence. The old establishment was a club. The new establishment is a network. And the thing about a network is that it's accessible to everybody. It's like a telephone exchange. You plug yourself in and out of a network. And that's a revolution because this country has been a country of old boys clubs. That's gone. The other great trend, of course, is globalization. And when you study the, the people I wrote about, had the big chapters about, you know, whether it's Izzy Asper or Peter Monk or Conrad Black, Jerry Schwartz, others. Uh, that's the mark of their success. They are not afraid to become global, and they've gone global. You know, uh, Izzy Sharp, the head of Four Seasons, has 60 hotels, only two in Canada. The rest are around the world. Asper is, as you know, it's networks around uh, across Ireland, and New Zealand, and Australia, and now Scotland. Jerry Swartz only has one major asset in Canada, and so on. And some of these people, I'm not making accusations, but it's true, some of these people, even though they still live here and the families are here, they use Canada as a kind of flag of convenience, or sometimes inconvenience, because it's simply not large enough playground to, make, to contain their ambitions. And I predict for the future that instead of um, borders retaining their current importance. There'll be associations, trading coalitions, and you have to go back to the, way back in history, to the Hanseatic League, which was a coalition of 30 North European cities that made a great trading partnership in the Middle Ages, and it worked. And those kind of alliances will come back into focus. Um, and certainly Winnipeg will be part of that trend you are already. The world is in the process of shifting not just to a global but to an interplanetary, interplanetary economy. It will have two main characteristics. It will deal mainly in such intangibles as information and it will be intensely interlinked. Existing networks, the relationship and contracts we all nurture will become the central nervous system of the economies. The network economy is founded on technology but built on relationships. And that's, you know, that's really very different because there was a time when it mattered where you went to school, who your father was, clubs you belonged to, and that's all gone. The kind of world I'm talking about, everything depends on what you've done, what you've achieved, which is great. You know, a meritocracy awards people of merit, and that's the way it should be, not because their father had married or because their school had married or their club has married, but, but who, what they've done now, tomorrow. But there's a dispersal of authority and money in this process. Individuals and corporations are voting with their modems. Virtual sites on the web offer incorporation in Belize, bank accounts in Switzerland, currency trading in Luxembourg. It's all possible and it's all happening. And let me give you some scale. You know, we talk about globalization, and it's kind of become a kind of a cliche, the word itself. But let me give you the scale of globalization. Only 21 of the world's largest economies are still countries. After that, a majority of the next 50 largest economies are corporations. Walmart is bigger than Poland, Greece. General Motors is larger than Denmark. Ford is bigger than Turkey, and so on. And nothing is what it seems. And I went to buy a television set recently. I asked the salesman, where, where do they come from? And he said, well, the Korean sets uh, are made in Malaysia, the Japanese are mostly in the United States, and the American brands are made in Mexico. And the currency flows are awesome. I mean, there's, there is about, I have this in my book, I forget the exact figure, but it's about $20 billion a day going through Toronto now. And, you know, that's what happened yesterday is going to I increase Toronto's importance, at least in terms of stocks, stock exchange. But the stock exchange, including the currency exchange, handles about $20 billion a day. It's the seventh largest financial center in the world. And the total, the global total of currency trades is $1.3 trillion a day, <clears throat> which, add up, which adds up to $474 trillion a year. 
But when you analyze that $474 trillion, only $8 trillion of it is actually currency trading. The rest is speculation. And that's scary. The global economy is anarchy, bound by few, few rules except those of the Darwinian jungle. Capital markets already operate in cyberspace. And, you know, that's something we don't think about. There, there's a program called Virtual Reality. The sales of that program are increasing 16% a month. And it allows people and institutions and corporations to transfer money anywhere in the world. And the transfer is instant, untraceable, and it costs 18 cents each. And money is just coursing around the world. And what scares me, and what must scare people like Gary Filman, is, is where is the tax base going to come from? You know, if, if that money keeps going out there, how are municipalities, provinces, countries going to raise the taxes that they need to do essential things? And there's, I don't have an answer for that. I, I throw that out as a question, one of the great questions of the next millennium. May West once declared with a wink that too much of a good thing is terrific. <laughs> but, but in this case, I'm not so sure. Because I think there's, as, as the quantity of money in these offshore places keeps growing, there will be a qualitative change. And I think that Milton Friedman is wrong when he insists that the only obligation of the corporation is to make profit. Unbridled markets are not perfect. Decency, fairness, and compassion must be part of the equation. I remember talking to Jacques Maisonrouge when he was the head of uh, IBM International. And I asked him, you know, how they treat the Canadian border. And his eyes glazed over. And he said, oh, yeah, the Canadian border. I said, no, no, you know, we're, we have a country here, and you, you've got to recognize that. How do you treat us differently from your own domestic market? And he said, well, we don't. To us, a border is like the equator. It's just a line on a map. It doesn't mean anything. And he was right. You know? Well, I don't know if he was right, but he, but he was certainly reflected the, the thinking of multinationals. And that's going to be the future. And that's why, you know, if we're going to defend Canada, uh, we have to do it to some extent, to some degree, as a, on a cultural basis, because economically it's going to be very difficult. The tax havens are just uh, incredible. I went to the Cayman Islands as part of the research for my book, this is an island 11 miles, sorry, 11, 11 kilometers wide, 32 kilometers long. It's the fourth largest financial center on earth, 550 banks. Um, there's only one newspaper, incidentally, the, the Cayman Compass, which has columns about teaching your parrot how to talk. And, and guess who owns the Cayman Compass? Conrad Black. 